Welcome to a special bonus episode of 10 with Ken. I'm Ken Steele. In September, we went on location to the 2017 Ontario University's Fair to speak with presidents and senior administrators about innovation in higher education. We're at the Trent University booth where I'm speaking with Leo Grork, the president and vice chancellor. The first question was, what innovations at Trent University make you justifiably proud and could serve as examples for other institutions to learn from across North America? Trent's very much decided that it's proud of being a primarily undergraduate institution. We do great in research rankings and that's important to us, but we want to be a smaller institution, probably one of the smallest institutions in Canada, and we're really proud that we take undergraduates really seriously. The government officials will say that's a breath of fresh air. Trent started as an institution really modeled after Oxford and Cambridge and, and Harvard. The university was a federation of distinct colleges and student life and activity happened within those colleges. So one of the things we're trying to do is reinforce and bring back colleges as they used to be. Of course, everywhere there are challenges with the humanities, as you know. Students these days want career programs, I think too much, but that's the reality. We're trying very hard to look uh, for ways to have unique programming in humanities. And that's typically by combining humanities with something else. At Trent, you can do honors business. You can combine it with honors archaeology, with honors English, with honors history, with honors philosophy, with honors sciences, with honors biology, honors chemistry. We went to a law school in Wales, Swansea University. They ranked first in the United Kingdom in student satisfaction. And we have arranged an agreement with them which allows students to get an honors undergraduate degree in almost anything. I mean, humanities is part of it, but also in science, also in business, and then to go to Swansea Law School for two years, and then to come back, and they will finish in Canada, and they can do the bar ads in Ontario, and they can practice law in Canada. So, both uh, an honors undergraduate degree, a law program, an international experience, and a professional career all rolled into one. We're looking for great things from that in the future. We have a wonderful library. If you read architecture books in Canada, you'll see the Battle Library there, but it was 50 years old and the skylight was dripping and there were problems with the infrastructure. So we have a $20 million renovation which will deal with the deferred maintenance and spruce the building up, uh, but it will also radically change the library. There will be less print collection. It's a significant reduction, probably 50%, but that will open up a whole lot of space and that's space for active learning. There'll be an entrepreneurship center, there'll be research centers in there, there'll be some classrooms in there, and of course there'll be a lot of digital resources. Next year we'll be starting over again with the Library of the Future, so that should make a significant difference to the campus. We're developing a research park. We have 85 acres, we'll have one of the largest research parks in Canada, and the focus of our research park is environmental sciences and green industry. And We've done a lot of work, we have a partnership with the city, we're putting in $12 million of infrastructure. It is designed to be a revenue stream. It is designed to focus on research, but also it's very much designed to provide experiential learning for undergraduate students. What major innovations do you anticipate will become more mainstream in Canadian higher ed over the next five or ten years? So I think uh, for sure internationalization is going to be a very significant component of the next five to ten years of Canadian universities. Universities have some budget challenges and bringing in uh, loads and loads of international students is a way to do that, but I look at it in a very positive way. You're bringing in bright young people. They're learning about your country. You're learning about theirs. You're working together and establishing relationships. Some of them will even stay in Canada and make huge contributions to Canada. That's about building the kinds of sensitivities and understanding that the, the future needs. I will mention indigenization. It's an interesting time in teaching about and working with and learning from indigenous communities. Now at Trent, that's not very new. We had the first undergraduate program in indigenous studies in Canada and the first PhD in indigenous studies in Canada. So, so we've been doing this a long time and our approach has always been 
It's not just about teaching indigenous students about science. We practice what we call indigenous ways of knowing and what's the indigenous understanding of the land and we've got this wonderful program in indigenous environmental science where students take science courses and indigenous studies courses and try to marry both the kind of Eurocentric scientific understanding of the world and the environment and the indigenous way and that's a very exciting program. Do you anticipate changes over the next five or ten years in the style of pedagogy? It's, it's a good question what's going to happen in the classroom. Uh, of course, online continues to progress, but you know, if you look at what happened with MOOCs, I mean, they were supposed to radically transform the system, and certainly from where I sit, they've had marginal effect. I mean, in some places they matter, but they've had marginal effect. I think it will continue. I think uh, more likely what's going to happen is there's an increasing push for experiential learning. The Ontario government has said it wants 100% of students to have some kind of experiential learning opportunity. That might be too lofty, both because I'm not sure there are that many opportunities out there, but also universities are a place of reflection. I mean, part of university needs to be to get away from regular life and think about things, and so uh, let's not turn reflection into a bad thing, but I think next five, ten years, experiential learning is going to become a larger and larger part of what we do at university. From one point of view, I think we're headed into tough times for universities. Essentially, governments have deficits. Uh, government funding is frozen or even declining. The demographics are going the wrong way. So I think for institutions, we're headed into a difficult period. But uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And if there's one thing universities are good at doing, it's good at recreating themselves in useful ways. Universities are environments of great innovation and research at the same time as they are incredibly conservative places. And we have a culture that is pretty focused on zero fault tolerance. But now we've got more and more interest in fostering innovation on campus in terms of student services, in terms of revenue generation, in terms of teaching and learning practices, in terms of new program development. I'm asking university leaders what leadership can do to create the preconditions to, to foster an environment where innovation can flourish. Uh, I, I like the term fault tolerance. Universities have not had a lot of tolerance for people making mistakes and people doing poorly academically, etc. And that, I'm going to say, is a mistake. Especially when you talk about innovation and entrepreneurship. And not just entrepreneurship in a business sense, but innovation in the way we think about things and the, and the way we do things generally. You can't be creative if you're terrified of making a mistake. You need to have a lot of room for people taking the wrong steps and, and making mistakes in almost an experimental way. Often it will turn out that what was the wrong way of doing something, there was some important grain of truth in it that actually becomes the basis of the next step forward. I would even say that the way we accept students into university, uh, we put too much emphasis on grades. You know, there are some students that apply who have 98% averages and through their whole life they've never failed at anything, especially they've never failed at school. Some of the best students I've ever had failed in high school. We need people who are willing to take the risks it takes to do things differently and when you take those risks and do things differently you're going to make mistakes and you won't always uh, get it right and it's very important to have a culture that recognizes that failure tolerance I, I like it I mean I do think if there were a physicist out there with ideas as radical as Einstein's it wouldn't be very safe to move forward with them you would not get government funding to pursue them Peer review would oppose the publication of them. It, 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 the, the system is stacked against radically creative ideas. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say I agree. People who uh, step outside the box, well, often they don't make it, that's for a start. The ones that are real outside the box have huge difficulty at the beginning of the career, but if they last 30 years, they're the people that invent new ways of thinking about things and new way of doing things. At 
this level of administration, you're not very directly involved in things, but to look for people who are innovative and support them and put them in positions of authority and uh, support them, whether it's financially or even it's just psychologically or otherwise. And the way, for example, the budget works at universities, 95% of the budget goes to establish programs and it's very difficult uh, to change that. Universities are academically conservative institutions. Institutions are very slow to change programs, but that means there's lots of opportunities if you have the right people who think differently and outside of the box to invent new things. And there's always new possibilities out there. But a great topic, how do we do that? Go write the book. Leo, thanks for taking some time with me today. Great to see you uh, again, Ken. From... And thank you for all your deep thinking about post-secondary education, Ken. And thank you. <laughs> and thank you for you can use that sharing you that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. 10 with Ken is a production of Eduvation Inc. Copyright 2017. I'm available for conference keynotes, campus PD events, board retreats, and committee workshops in person or now virtually too. For more information, please visit www.eduvation.guru or tenwithken.com.